So I'm happy to walk around with the uh, microphone if anyone has questions. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Sayyid Aziz. I'm a scientist at Health Canada and adjunct professor in the Department of Pathology, University of Ottawa. Can you speak a little closer? Uh, sure. Um, as a student of science and the affected member of the scientific community, um, I don't have any question, but I would like to make some comments on that, uh, what you have presented. Um, and I think uh, what um, North America and Europe is nowadays is just because of the innovation, inventions, and research. If we take out these things from North America, I don't know where we will go. And if we're not going to do this kind of a research, then somebody else will going to do. And this I am um, uh, saying based on my personal observation, uh, because uh, I'm an editor of few journals, and whatever the papers I'm receiving nowadays, about 70% are from China. So they are very much populating the, uh, the, the scientific bank of research nowadays. So I would like to have your c comments as well on this one. Uh, I'm not sure what to say. Um, I cannot comment on, on, the, on the claim about China, and I don't think that's a bad thing to happen anyway. Uh, and uh, uh, science is a lot more important to the developing world than, than it is to the developed world, and science education even more important to the developing world, and, and this can only be commented. Now, about the value of science itself in, in North America, uh, To put it very crudely, I think science has a kind of an inherent value. It doesn't matter where it's practice, uh, and, and uh, it, 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 it's to, it, my, my own slogan is that science is the best thing we humans as a species have invented to understand the world and, 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 promote, uh, and promote reason. And, and of course, uh, science has effects and consequences in the way we view the world, in the way we interact with the world, in the way we exploit the world, and of course, various values get involved there. And um, the important uh, question that needs to be asked, I'm going to ask this question in next week in Toronto, and I'm going to try to answer it, is whose values is that? It's not as if values are neutral. It's not as if values are up there and we just pull them down. And there are different values. If different social groups or economic groups have different values. So it's really important to uh, answer. When, when values are introduced, we should ask whose values and, and, and the benefit of, 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 of uh, the well-being of the people and the well-being of the environment are two important values which we should all treasure anyway, irrespective of economic interests and, and uh, political and ideological conceptions. There was mm. a question over there. I have one there. Mm. So if I thought there was so one. I'll start here. I didn't see any on anyone else had their hand up. Um, thank you for that excellent talk. It was, I think, good to have the current sort of war on science yeah. be put into perspective with the historical context. Um, you sort of demonstrated how the war on science was won the last time it was faced. I'm wondering if you have any sort of advice for how we can sort of win this most recent incarnation of the war on science. Keep keep doing successful science. I mean, the, the story that I didn't tell about the, the 19th century uh, was uh, uh, a few years after the debate ended, uh, practically, there was a huge triumph in, in scientific uh, uh, enterprise. And this was uh, Einstein's work on Brownian motion and John Perrin's work on Brownian motion. and what scientists took to be a conclusive proof, which does not mean a mathematical proof, but you know, a mounting huge amount of evidence for the reality of molecules and atoms. So the very idea that science should be just descriptive as opposed to explanatory was dealt a huge blow by science itself. Uh, so what I would say nowadays is that a, keep doing, you know, science, good science, that's an important thing. This, this is really, you know, what scientists know how to do best, and, and we're grateful to, to this. And, but in my own view, and that's my own personal view, uh, what happened back then 
was a social mobilization, social mobilization of forces in various scientific, you know, literary, political forces who defended science. And unless this happens now, if there is an, indeed a, a danger that, that science is actually in, in threat uh, in Canada, uh, the wind is not going to be on the good side. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm myself a theoretical physicist. And uh, sometimes you hear that uh, an observation is never confirmed until there is a theory behind it. Um, so going back to your pessimism, uh, historical per pessimism, I think it's called, uh, I think the pessimism comes less from data than from interpretation of data. So as time goes on, we have better instruments and we make more discoveries and we add a decimal place to the measurement and so on. And what used to be an interpretation now is, is past and we need a new interpretation. And in a sense, the war against science today is not against the data, but it's against the interpretation that we make of the data. Does it mean uh, that global warming, is it due to human beings or not? I agree. Um, that's an example. We, um, I mean, the, the, the war against science in the U.S. is, in part, uh, evolution also. Uh, so nobody contests all kinds of things except the final conclusion that we, uh, we, we come from, from uh, lower, you know, uh, um, evolution. Um, so I think pessimism was based on that as well. And we see this pessimism or, or cynicism, if you wish, today in, uh, in health. Um, you know, one year you hear that you have to eat this, and the year after you shouldn't. Coffee is good this year, it's not good next year, and so on and so forth. So I, I think there's a mix of cynicism now that, that looks like pessimism in the past. I, I'd like to have your opinion yeah, about it's, this. It's a, it's a very good question, and it's actually quite a few questions together, and that's, you know, it's, 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 it's a good point. Uh, there is clearly an issue of interpretation in science. I mean, and, and, but that's what science is about. Science is about theories, you know, and, you know, theories do not write on their forehead, I'm true or I'm false, you know, you've got to actually uh, show that they are true or false, and you know, getting the evidence to bear on one or the other theory is really an important, an important element. Uh, what, what, what I found worrying about what I'm, I'm hearing or I'm reading about Canada and the so-called war against science is mostly that uh, this is an internal scientific issue. So you can, you can fight with creationists on scientific grounds. You can fight with intelligent uh, design people on scientific ground. You can fight with uh, anthropogenic or non-anthropogenic climate change on, on scientific grounds. But what happens now, it seems to me, is that they want somehow to say, we, don't, we stop collecting evidence which is potentially relevant to answering these, these questions. And th that, that's even worse, you see, because once you, you don't even try to address these questions, and if you don't try to address this question, then the only answer will be ideological, will be, you know, that's, that's my view and that's what I want to, 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 to defend. And I think that, that's, that's really what's different now uh, in, in, in Canada. And of course, that, uh, in, in science, you know, better, you know better than me, there is always a matter of, you, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty in science, okay? And, you, you, and, and, and what, scientists always talk about proof, but they don't mean, don't mean mathematical proof. You don't prove theories in science like you prove Euclid's theory, the, axio, theorems from, from its axioms, okay? S and, and, and new evidence can come in and turn the tables around, as it were, okay? You know, t overturn your, your, your old views. Uh, and that's what I meant when I talked about historical pessimism, that, that uh, uh, sometimes this is exaggerated and it became a focal point at the end of the 19th century. That is, that if you look at, if you look at, at the history of science, it's a, it's a history of failures. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. I, mean, I think uh, uh, Poincaré was probably the first to put it forward as, as a claim that if you look at the history of science, you see change, but you see substantial continuity, you see invariance. Okay, and invariance tells us that what we are doing is not a dream. Okay, it doesn't give you the, the you know what what we are doing is touching reality. You need the extra argument about the success and how to explain it. That that's the key idea. Hi, I'm Bill Jeffrey with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. I just want to make a, an observation and ask a question. Uh, first of all, I I think that um, the distinctiveness is of science. Uh, can be overstated. It's really just an organized way of collecting uh, observations and analyzing them. 
And I, I wonder if you could comment on the, uh, the suggestion that this isn't really a war on science, uh, that uh, we're thinking about particularly in relation to the federal government's views on this, but it's a war on, um, uh, uh, it, it's a war on persuasive claims to truth. Uh, often uh, the current political leadership does side with science if it's consistent with its worldview, but is very critical of science that's contrary to that. Um, and maybe you can just uh, make a comment on that uh, observation. Uh, I, want to, I want to be careful in the following sense. I mean, yeah. war on science is a metaphor, of course. Okay, I don't think there is literally war on science. And, and, uh, and if you look at the data, as it were, there is probably conflicting information. I mean, you know, you, people, people will say that the you know, research budget in, in Canada has gone up uh, the last few years. Uh, but it seems to me what is really at stake here is that there are some scientific theories, there are some scientific domains of inquiry which are so sensitive okay, that the way they're going to go will influence the way we conceive of the world. And, uh, so, so I would... And, 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 and the, 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 what, what's sensitive nowadays at the end of, you know, the beginning of the 21st century, which was not sensitive at the end of the 19th century, is environment. So it, it, the, the concentration really of, of, of forces, if you like, against science are in this area. It's against, you know, uh, issues that have to do with the environment and exploitation of the environment, you know, climate change, science, and things like that. Have I answered your question? I'm not sure I... You we have uh, four more questions, okay. so yeah, I've got to be brief. maybe you can catch yeah. him afterwards. One here, one there, and then two in front. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have a quick question. What's your exact definition of the good science? For you, the good science is Sorry, something... Sorry, I didn't... Uh, can you... Uh, what is your exact definition of the good science? Is the good science for you is something which causes social solidarity or is it something which is solve the existing good, good problem? Good science? Good science. Because you're using this uh, terminology two times that the good science... Did I, did I say good science? Good yeah. science, yes. Uh, Go, I mean, <laughs> I, I exactly didn't catch it. Yeah, Once you uh, said this thing uh, like, as a good science, is there, it there, there, there is science, and, and, and there is bad science if it's if it's manufactured science, if it's science that you 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 you, you fake the data or you or you or you or you, or you or you cheat or you don't follow sound methodological rules or you you know suppress negative results and things like that. But that's a bad way to do science. Okay. And, and there is a good way to do science, which is what most scientists do. Basically, follow you know what what, what you know what we call the scientific method, and 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 there is scientific training and the scientific spirit, and they probe nature and they answer, and they they collect data and they interpret them. And and but uh, that that that's what I would say. I mean, it's not a matter of you know. It's there are good ways to do science and bad ways to do science, and and bad ways to do science are kind of self-defeating, of course. Uh, whereas good ways to do science tell us something about the world. Thank you. Let's move on. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating perspective. Um, going back to the very beginning of your talk, science really sort of caught hold in response to a catastrophe in Paris. In response to? A catastrophe. To a, the... the um, <coughs> to, you know all of the things that the citizens of Paris had to do in oh, order yeah, yeah, to yeah. survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I, um, it's, it's not something I would really recommend as a fun time, but it's really worth going to the War Museum to see how mu people responded um, it, with ingenious things as a, re as a result of war and how they came together. And um, when I look at what's happening to science now, and it's, it, I, I agree, it's the destruction of data, which is so bad because that means that you're losing future capabilities to, to do things. But I'm wondering what you think, um, and maybe you don't have a, any better crystal ball than I do, but um, going ahead, we are going to be facing some very hard times with climate change. and. Do you think eventually climate change will help to rejuvenate science? Uh, I don't know. Uh, 
my, 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 my view is that you know, climate change is, is the, coming, coming to terms with the whole issue of climate change is, is both a matter of you know, having evidence which seems to be overwhelming nowadays, everybody says, for a kind of an anthropogenic uh, uh, effect on, on climate. On, on, on climate. Uh, and various forces which are driven mostly by social, political, and ideological considerations, which want to undervalue this in order to keep you know, doing business as usual. So in a sense, that's both a scientific and a political battle, broadly political battle. And uh, the only way that these battles can be won, if you like, is by mobilization of the public. There is no other way. I mean, it was like the defense of Paris. The defense of Paris was there because the, the, the public was mobilized and, and uh, science was there to help, if you like, or scientists were there to help. Uh, but th I think that's, that's important and inevitable. Have I answered the question? That's a dangerous question. <laughs> it's a da yeah, I know, I know. It, it is a dangerous question. Sorry, I cannot. The acoustics is... I, I was thinking in terms of science for food supply, science for water, science for, you know, to maintain the necessities of life um, and to predict what's going to happen in the future, maybe on smaller scales. Um, yeah. there, I, I can just imagine that we're going to need science for a lot of things, science for extremely um, you know, low energy technologies, very good housing, or um, new, new ways of getting around. Uh, so all the, and also science to um, you know, sort of guide us in terms of, well, this worked well, this didn't work well, these are going to be good crops you know, in 20 years time in this area. That all, there's a huge amount of stuff that we'll have to do to adapt. So it's the adaption, yeah. adaptation. Well, I, I agree on this. Yeah. Gordon, yeah. Okay, we just need more uh, climate change and science is fine. Uh, Status, uh, I think the difference maybe between what you're describing in France and what's happening now, you noticed in the French situation that scientists are intertwining and taking very seriously the philosophical debates, right? And it's very uh, wonderful and surprising, uh, I guess, for people that don't know this history that uh, many of the people that are participating in the main debates are uh, discussing philosophically as scientists about the Absolutely. meaning of their science. They're also debating about the status of theories and laws. That's not what we're having right now. We might have had that a few years ago in the science wars when there was debates between constructivists. Some are, of them are good friends of mine and uh, others that are on the realist side of things. But now it's a debate, it seems just entirely on what uh, means evidence. At least those that are uh, trying to defend science are using the rhetoric of the death of evidence, right? And if you listen to them very closely, and they tell stories, and we've had several as our platforms in this lecture series, they say that all the government has to do is to listen to scientists because they have the right evidence. And if governments are run on the grounds of evidence, then everything is going to be hunky-dory, and we'll all be happy, and the world will uh, end up in total progress, and there will be no problems. Now, that's very philosophically naive, Agreed. right? Uh, like, like appallingly Agreed. philosophically naive, repeating stuff not from the 19 or 1870s and 80s and 90s, but from the 1920s and 30s, the um, technocracy and things like that, uh, uh, and without any so sort of philosophical sophistication on the part of those that are, are trying to defend science. Now, when they talk about evidence, there's actually something very peculiar about this very notion of evidence, of which the Economist magazine is actually very good in that report by saying that when people talk about evidence as being just uh, uh, like in the American Constitution is self-revealing or something like that, it's actually much more profound. The idea of replication of theories is, or replication of experiments is pr extremely problematic and most experiments aren't replicated. Uh, so I think it's a job of groups like the Rotman and also ISSP and 
uh, uh, situating sciences to snuggle much closer between the philosophical community and those in so science studies and people in sciences to get a real engagement that we cannot build on models, not debates that happened in France in the 1870s, but debates that already happened in the 1920s, which this pales in, sophistic uh, uh, in its sophistication. Can, can I make a comment here? That's an excellent point, and it <coughs> opens a can of worms. Uh, what's peculiar about France back then, it's really peculiar, but uh, probably historically and without precedent and without thing that happened after that, without something like that happening, it was that philosophy, serious philosophy was produced by first-rate scientists. The philosophers, the professional philosophers were lagging behind, were kind of trying to catch up with what scientists were putting forward as a serious philosophical view about their theories, the evidence, the history, the role of history, and they were creating science as well as philosophy. They were reflecting about the theories, the relation of the theories, uh, and the evidence, the co competition between theories, the role of conventions, the role of facts, and that's unprecedented, and that's something that has not happened ever since, I think. That's very, very peculiar. And that's partly because it was a huge scientific revolution lurking then, and they had to take you know, issue with uh, the foundations of the disciplines. Now, I've got a, 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 something that I say when I talk about evidence. Evidence doesn't speak with the voice of an angel. You, know, you interpret the evidence. And, and, and you've, you, you've got various ways to think what's good evidence, what's bad evidence, or to evaluate the evidence itself. And I, I agree that a lot of the debate, as far as I can understand it, at least from public speeches and things like that, is that, you know, here's the evidence, and the evidence is, says, you know, whatever, you know, uh, what the truth is, and therefore we should follow blindly what the evidence says. Uh, but it seems to me, although this is exaggerated, and, and philosophers, sociologists, social studies people, historians can actually work with the science to have a kind of a more nuanced account of evidence and how it relates to theory, what I, I think they sense and they react is that current political, the current political situation, if you like, or the current administration seems not to value evidence in the first place. That's why I say that's a debate about the value of evidence. It's, I mean, you can, you can raise the issue even if you think the evidence is interpretable and can be interpreted in different ways. You still go for the evidence and you try to interpret it. You don't suppress the evidence. You don't, you don't try to, know, to have less data, as it were. You, you go for more data. And you try to make appraising the evidence better you know, by replication, by reproduction, by, by finding ways to, to uh, 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 question the methodological assumptions involved in, 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 in trials, clinical trials, and things like that. That's, that's my point. So, uh, considering that we have refreshments in the back, I would say the last two questions should be as concise as possible. But Dan, you have the... Do you, are you okay? Then let's make this the last question, please. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to pick up on the, the last three lines in red, in which you are pointing to the uh, what's different now is the curbing of the sources of data, uh, which evidence thrives. Uh, I agree with that point of view, but I think there's another a, a, a complementary part I, I'm referring in particular to in Canada now with an agency like Statistics, Statistics Canada was, was recognized many times by The Economist magazine as one of the best in the world. Well, and the current government has taken away the long form census, which yeah. is, you know, a major issue for the general public, if not just the technical demographers, that there indeed one is curbing the sources of the data. But I also see a major trend within that agency toward having the, the government employees merely produce data, but not being allowed to analyze or interpret data in an independent fashion and contribute to a larger, more uh, public policy kind of debate. So I see this, and, and the consequence of that then is that government is cherry-picking the available data, doing their own interpretation and analysis to justify their preset political agenda. I, I, I think that's an excellent point. And, and uh, in, in a comment on this excellent point is that it seems to me there is a wrong conception of what it is for someone to be a government scientist. It's, I mean, <laughs> a government scientist works for the government, but it's a member of the public at the same time 
who is going to suffer or not suffer from the, from the consequences of the policies followed by the government, okay? So we ask the government scientists to keep only one part of the identity, as it were, that he works for the government, he's being paid by the government, and forget that he's part of the general public as well, f uh, for whom the acts of government should be accountable. He, you know, he, so, so he's got the right to criticize the government, you know, or if you like, the policies or the, the data or the, you know, the decisions based, uh, not just because he's a scientist and therefore a free spirit by definition, if you like, but because he's also a member of the public. Uh, so governments should not be taken to work like, you know, uh, in private firms, okay, and executive boards. They are there to serve the public, I think, I hope. Thank you very much. You have been very patient with questions. So please let's give our speaker a big thank you for this thought-provoking contribution. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much.